Welcome, 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 everybody, to another Sunday of When Black Women Gather. My name is Helen Higginbotham. and I'm the founder of this organization. And today, I am impressed that we have two wonderful guests who are going to lead us through a very fascinating and uh, intriguing conversation on, I'm calling it Farming While Black, but we're really talking about the plight of Black farmers and the future of agriculture um, in America. And it's important to us, obviously, because for so many of us that, you know, Black families, that was our foundation. And how did it go from being our foundation to Black farmers are struggling to survive and not um, getting the, the assets and the resources that they need? So I'm actually going to be totally in the background, and I'm going to leave it up to these two ladies to engage us in conversation. We have, and I'm hoping I'm saying your name right, Elzad, and she told me, but I forgot. So I'm going to say Miss Washington. Elzadia. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Elzadia, thank you so much. And sorry about that. And uh, Samanetta um, will do introductions of her and and I think those of you who've been on here before, you know, uh, especially those of you who are on the Google group, you know Samanetta. She's very <laughs> vocal. Uh, what you yes. may not have known about her is that she works for USDA. Yeah. So on that note, um, we will let them engage in conversation. I'll jump in every now and then as need be. And please, please, please put, um, everybody should be on mute if you're not talking. That makes it easier for us and um, place any questions that you have in the chats and we'll all be um, you know, perusing the chats to make sure that we get to your questions. So, Samanetta, thank right. you so much, uh, my dear. <laughs> um, it's good to be on this platform and to see you all virtually, of course. Um, thank you so much, Ms. Elzadia Washington for joining this conversation. Um, I'll let her introduce herself as well, but I just wanna give, um, initial introductions and kind of give a, a format as to how this discussion is going to, um, you know, sort of the trajectory of this conversation. So of course, we'll begin with introductions. As Ms. Higginbotham mentioned, my name is Simonetta. Um, I'm an agriculturalist. Um, this is my field. I also like to say I'm a farmer by um, association because my grandfather um, owned cocoa farms and um, grew a variety of crops, rice, cocoa, yam, sorghum, um, for generations. Um, and so I, 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 I recall, you know, memories of visiting his farms and a lot of the, the laborers on the farms were domestic from Ghana or from Togo. Um, and I just remember every, every holiday season, um, you know, it was customary to share the surplus of the crops with the, the neighboring communities um, or slaughter a cow or a goat and share. Um, that was something that he he took a lot of pride in. And so agriculture, the history um, is just in my heart. And it's the foundation of any community or any society, the ability to feed and clothe yourself. Um, so this is a near and dear topic to my heart. Um, so Miss Washington is with the National Black Growers Council. And she'll go more into this, but this, but she, but but her organization um, basically works to advocate for Black farmers in the United States. Um, and so I came across her organization a couple years ago. Um, I've attended um, a few of their meetings and their annual events in Arkansas, in Memphis, Tennessee, most recently, um, and then they have frequent farm visit tours where you can actually go and visit farmers on the ground, learn about what they're growing, what their constraints are, and it's just a wonderful collaborative initiative. Um, I was in Mississippi also recently um, visiting a, a farm over there, and it was, it, it really brought a lot of things back home. Um, so again, Beginning with introductions, um, Ms. Elzadia will, will expand on her background. Um, and then afterwards, um, just to give a little bit more context, I think it's important to sort of delve into the history of Black farmers in the United States. Um, how did we get to where we are? So I wrote a wonderful one-page manifesto here <laughs> just to give a little of a bit of background context and an appreciation for the strong history of Black farming in this country and the contribution of Black farmers in this country um, from the 18th century up to where we are now, how we got to where we are. 
Um, so after introductions, we'll we'll go on to the history, and then Miss Elzadia will take over and and go on um, and let us know more about her organization, um, and then we'll open up for for uh, questions and answer period. So. Ms. Elzadia, Ms. Washington, please, please feel free to um, give us some introductions and, and, and then we'll move on with, to the history. Um, hi, guys. Uh, again, sorry for being late. And uh, I guess I'm a little flustered because there's been so much stuff going on the last 24 hours. But again, my name is Elzadia Washington. And um, hold on one second. Let me get this doc out of here. So excuse me for one minute. No problem. Um, I um, we can talk a little bit about her. She gave me a little bit on her background, so let me pull it up. And I, while she's doing that, I'll read to you what she sent to me. Um, oh, she's back. <laughs> I don't know what I sent. <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell me if I miss anything out of my own introduction. <laughs> um, I'm from rural Arkansas. I grew up in Arkansas on a black farm. Uh, I grew up literally picking cotton and picking okra. Okra was actually our cash crop. So that's, and I, um, my entire neighborhood in rural Arkansas, well, I'm literally 15 minutes from downtown Memphis. So that's how close I am to Memphis, Tennessee, but on the Arkansas side. So basically we have the best of both worlds. We're in the rural area as well as um, having access to a large metropolitan, I'm moving around, sorry, a large metropolitan area called Memphis, Tennessee. But I grew up in a very, literally, very close knitted community, all black, went to an all black elementary school, which was really in the country. Uh, then we were bused to West Memphis, we're five miles down the road to um, the city where I went to high school, the one and only black high school in the area, Wanda, Wanda High. In 1971, we integrated. And it was the first time that I had actually interacted with non-blacks. My graduation class of 1972 was an integrated class. If you ask me today, what do I remember? I really don't remember very much because the black stuck with the blacks, the whites stayed with the whites. I mean, it wasn't negative or anything, it was just the way it was. So I graduated from high school in 1972, the first integrated four year high school in my community in an integrated setting. Um, went on to school in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, two hours from where I live and it was a fluke that I majored in ag economics. When I went to school, I had no clue what I was going to major in. In fact, I didn't even want to go to college. My grandfather made me go, actually, because I wanted to go to the big city. But I did go on to UAPB. Then it was Arkansas AM, and then today is UAPB Pine Bluff, University of Arkansas Pine Bluff. And um, a friend of my aunt, who we were all there together, my aunt, I have a basically a twin, even though I was born in October, Edna was born in December, but we all grew up like twins. Uh, and my aunt, who was two years older, was already at UAPB. And uh, one of her friends at the end of the first semester just happened to see my grades and said, Yo, you're kind of smart, what are you gonna major in? I'm like, I have no clue. He suggested agriculture, like you must be out of your doggone mind. I grew up picking cotton. There is no way I'm gonna be a farmer. So, <laughs> but he convinced me to go and talk to the major professor, Dr. Gordon, who offered me a scholarship right on the spot. He offered my aunt and I were together. So it was a Ross Purina dog food scholarship. So I was offered a three-year scholarship, work study. And at that point in my life, I major in anything you want to major in if you're going to give me a scholarship. Because coming from a rural area, you know, your folks did as much as they could for you, but then you're on your own when you went off to college getting jobs and, you know, work so whatever. So I ended up majoring in ag economics, graduated. My aunt and I were the first two females to graduate in the agriculture department in Pine Bluff at the University of Arkansas Pine Bluff Historical Black College. And that was in 1976. I worked for five years with USDA and then went to graduate school at the University of Florida and got a master's in ag economics. 
Uh, then I went at the end of my um, working on my thesis, I was invited to go to DC to teach a class on how to establish an agricultural bank, uh, agriculture production banking system. And I went to uh, work with my major professor on teaching this course. It just so happened that the course, all of the participants were from foreign countries, from Ghana, other countries. There were 25 students and 20 were from 20 different countries. And um, my major professor suggested I go talk to the organization who was financing that, that training. And it was the United States Agency for International Development, USAID, which is part of the State Department. It is the agency responsible for implementing all the foreign aid that's given to foreign countries. Sometimes I express it in terms of we are the FEMA of the world too, um, dealing with humanitarian assistance across the board. Well, I was hired after several interviews and one of the questions from a technical team was, why do you, I didn't own a passport, had never really knew where, you know, had never been outside the United States, definitely, for sure. Didn't own a passport. And he asked, why do you think that you would be um, good to work in the agricultural um, arena, having not been exposed to developing countries? And my response to that was, I have been exposed to developing in a sense that I grew up in rural Arkansas, where we actually picked cotton by hand. We chopped, we did all of that. Then I probably got a little arrogant and said, you ain't gonna find nobody else with my qualification. Has an advanced degree in agriculture and have right. the actual hands-on experience working in the field. So the countries that I would be assigned to was similar to how I grew up, you know, doing everything by hand, planting, harvesting across the board. Uh, so I was hired on. And fast forward 30 years, my entire career was in developing countries. My longest tour was at six years in Egypt working on an air pollution program. Uh, but I was hired as an ag development officer. My first post was Mali, where I worked on, it was during the height of the drought in the 80s. People were literally dying from, from starvation. Um, one of the roles that I was responsible for was doing an assessment of the food needs in the country of Mali back in 80, 83 to determine how much food needed to be imported into the country from around the world, including the United States. From Mali, four years to Cameroon, Uganda, Haiti, Philippines, Egypt. I lived and worked um, my entire career overseas. I did one, one tour in DC for three years and that was it. The rest of my 32 years was overseas. All, I have three daughters, all three graduated from high school overseas. Uh, one in the Philippines, one in Uganda, one in Namibia, which is um, north of South Africa. Then I came back, retired, came back home. I always said I was coming back to rural Arkansas. That has always been a goal of mine from day one. I bought 10 acres adjacent to the family farm. So when I retired, I was living in Memphis at one point, but then I have now moved to build my house on the family farm next to my mom, my uncle, aunt, aunt, aunt. there are eight of us who have come back and living on the family farm. So we're all our own little community. My nephew farms, all the family land. I went into vegetable farming. I have four acres of vegetable farming. Uh, someone asked what I grow and I said, this year all I grew with weeds. So it didn't pan out like I had hoped to. So <laughs> my farm is not doing as great. So I have to work on it, but I have to stay put as well. Yeah, as anyone know that vegetable farming is very late intense and you have to be present especially if you're trying to do naturally grown i would never be certified organically mainly because i'm surrounded by soybean fields and if you know anything about soybeans and cotton and rice there's a lot of chemicals there's a lot of drift so and dicam was a big issue in my neighborhood so i try to do naturally grown but i was um uh I was asked by a friend of mine three years ago to help. I have an uncle who's also on the National Black Council uh, board. And I was asked to help organize an annual meeting in Memphis three years ago as a volunteer. And I did. And then after that, they asked me to join on a part-time basis working with the National Black Growers Council. So that's what I do now. It's supposed to be part-time, but this is now becoming a full-time job and this is not what I signed up for. But I do manage uh, two of their grants and I can go over how the organization started, the history, the background, what our mission and goals and objectives are. 
Oh, now I'm out of breath. Yeah, that was good. <laughs> I love all of that. I'm sorry, Summer, that I'm jumping in because I wanted you to no, talk about okay. being, being uh, first of all, USAID. These organizations don't have a good track record for hiring Black folks, even in our own yeah. you know, countries. And, yeah. you know, when you were a student of agricultural economics, you had to be the only Black female, maybe very few females, I'm assuming. Well, no, of course, at UAPB is a historically Black university. So, yeah, I was the only female in a male world back in the 70s. So my aunt and I were the only two females in the entire department. Uh, by the time I graduated, more and more females were starting to come into the program. My understanding, almost world nationwide, 40% of ag majors are females today. So fast forward 40 plus years. Um, and graduate school at University of Florida, yes, you're right. I was one of three Black females in the entire, that I knew of the School of Agriculture. Uh, with USAID, yes. Like I said, when I joined, I didn't. I had never been overseas. My class of 25 interns at the time, uh, there were only two of us who did not own a passport. And out of that class of 25, I think there may have been four Blacks. So yeah, my entire career being in the agriculture sector has been predominantly male, predominantly white males. When I was got out of UAPB and went to work in Louisiana as an agriculture statistician. It was back in those days, it was called the Crop and Livestock Reporting Agency. Today is NAS, National Agriculture Statistical Service. I was the only Black in that entire for the state of Louisiana and the only, of course, few, and nationwide, one of the few ag statistician. I managed, because I was over the enumerated data collection unit, and I supervise 50 white males and train them on how to collect agriculture data. And I had no issues for the most part. And the issues that I did have were with the white females, ironically, interesting. But, you know, I did have a standard, the day you touch is the day you die. So they all kind of knew where that line was drawn. So that was pretty clear. <laughs> So as a result, never had an issue with these guys. But um, so you're right. In terms of USAID, I was one of the few Black females that made it to the uh, what you call mission directors, the person responsible for the entire country. I was deputy director of the country of Uganda, deputy in the Philippines. And in Uganda, we had probably $500 million budget. And I oversaw quite a bit of that as the deputy from HIV AIDS to a conflict mitigation to uh, millions of people in displaced, uh, displaced camp due to the war in Northern Uganda. Of course, HIV AIDS and malaria were big issues in the health sector. So I managed those and in, including the agriculture economic growth. But in the Philippines, I was deputy in the Philippines, but then for a year, more than a year, I was acting uh, USAID country director. And then I was mission director in Namibia. So yeah, in my world, there were, um, you know, I come from very good, strong, more character growing up in rural Arkansas. Um, so I think that helped just the way I grew up in terms of treat others as you would have them treat you, uh, being respectful. And, you know, of course, being a black female, you had to give 120%. My kids all consider me a workaholic, which I tend to be. Um, if we going out for happy hour, I'm still talking work. And most people said, I didn't know how to turn off. And that's true. <laughs> it's hard for me to turn, turn off when I'm in, uh, um, I just love what I do. So what can I say? I love what I do. I volunteer now with the American Red Cross. I've been to deploy four or five times, uh, with them. Uh, well, actually more than five times, but, um, I just love, I love what I do. I love working with with people in general, I lo especially love working with farmers. I really do. And if there's any knowledge that I can share, I offer that free of charge. If I can help you get to the next stage of life, whatever it may be, I'm more than happy to do that. Um, so, so yeah, it's been uh, it's been a fun. I try to have fun wherever I'm doing, wherever I am. Uh, I do have a. Uh, <laughs> I do speak my mind, but I try to do it with a smile. Sometimes, 
sometimes it just comes out. I mean, I have no secret, so my world is open. <laughs> Okay, I appreciate thank that. You. Thank you so much, Ms. Washington. Um, and of course, you know, you, you'll be speaking more about the National Black Growers Council. I just wanted to segue into history. Um, part of the reason why I'm so impassioned about Black farmers um, is because I've taken the time to do my research, to read, to try to understand and to contextualize Um I'm first generation um, American, um, raised here, bred here, but I, for the longest time, I didn't have the context of what it took for so many Black Americans to get to where they are, to get to where, you know, we are as a nation. Um, and without having a grounding and understanding of that history, I don't think we can really sit and truly appreciate and value and advocate effectively without understanding the full context. So with that said, through my readings, it was so hard because you've got pages and pages of deep history to unpack, where do we even start? So I tried to synthesize all the information that I was absorbing into one page. Um, and I figured the best way to organize my thoughts and to organize the information was to just write it down and then just read it verbatim. So that's what I'm going to do now, just to give an overview for those who may not have an, is an extensive background on just the history of agriculture, but specifically Black agriculture in the United States. So this is from going from 18th century to the present, synthesized into one page. Um, so here I go. So beginning in the 18th century, plantation owners brought a mass of enslaved peoples from Africa, the Caribbean, and Mexico to farm the fields during cotton harvests. Black women and children were also enslaved in the industry. The growth of slavery in the United States is closely tied to the expansion of plantation agriculture. The contributions of enslaved people on early American agriculture has largely been discounted and ignored mainly because of the lack of records not created by the slaveholder, often writing to justify enslavement. However, many plantation owners relied on the agricultural knowledge that Africans brought over from across the Atlantic. The enslaved had experience with farming and they used the knowledge they had with growing food to cultivate vital crops and the owners needed them to use the skills they learned from their country before they became enslaved. Perhaps the best example of this is rice cultivation in South Carolina, relying on indigenous West African knowledge of growing Oriza glabarima. This specific knowledge was invaluable in transforming South Carolina into a rice producing powerhouse. The great majority of black farm workers between 1865 were enslaved workers on Southern farms and plantations. Smaller numbers were free employees or farm owners. In South Carolina, there were about 400 free black farmers in the rural parishes surrounding Charleston. As farmers, their strategies, production and rural lives resembled the poor white neighbors. Survival was a high priority and involved establishing economic self-sufficiency through concentration on food crops for their own families. And then by cultivating social advantages such as having a rich white patron. After emancipation and the passage of the 13th Amendment, Black enslaved people were legally freed, but most of them lacked any kind of material wealth and were thus led into other oppressive relationships. Many Black agriculturalists were subjected to land tenure agreements and working as sharecroppers, tenant farmers, and within the cropland system. Southern Black cotton farmers faced discrimination from the North. Many white Democrats were concerned about how many of African-Americans were being employed in the U.S. cotton industry and the dramatic growth of black landowners. They urged white farmers in the South to take control of the industry, which from time to time resulted in strikes by black cotton pickers. For instance, black people led by the Colored Farmers Association strikers from Memphis organized the cotton picker strike of 1891 in Lee County in September, which resulted in much violence. The conditions for Black farmers gradually improved during the 20th century. 
Ralph L. Bunch, an expert in Negro suffrage in the United States, observed in 1940 that many thousands of Black cotton farmers each year now go to the polls, stand in line with their white neighbors, and mark their ballots independently without protest or intimidation in order to determine government policy toward cotton production control. However, discrimination toward Black people continues as it did in the rest of society, and isolated incidents often broke out. For more than a century after the Civil War, deficient civil rights and various economic and social barriers were applied to maintaining a system where many Black people worked as farm operators with a limited and often total lack of opportunity to achieve ownership and operating independence. Diminished civil rights also limited collective action strategies, such as cooperatives and unions. Even so, various types of cooperatives, including farmer associations, were organized in Black farming communities prior to the 1960s. During the 1960s, the civil rights movement brought a new emphasis on cooperatives. Over the past century, Black farmers in America have lost more than 12 million acres of farmland because of systemic racism, biased government policy, and inequitable social and business practices. Today, just 1% of farmers in the United States identify as Black, according to the United States Department of Agriculture. These numbers are down from 1 million Black farmers a century ago. In 1919, Black farmland ownership peaked at 16 to 19 million acres, about 14% of total agricultural land. A century later, 90% of that land has been lost. In 2010, the Biden administration doled out more than $2 billion in direct payments for Black and minority farmers discriminated against by USDA. More than 23,000 farmers were approved for payments ranging from 10,000 to 500,000, according to USDA. The payments came after a lawsuit filed on behalf of Black farmers over decades of discrimination in USDA loan access. Finally, in 2021, 20% of Black individuals experienced food insecurity, which was more than three times the rate of white households. The Black community consistently faces high rates of hunger due to social, economic, and environmental challenges. To address the high rates of food insecurity amongst Black people, many people in the Black community are returning to their agricultural roots to ensure their neighbors have access to nutrient-rich foods. And that's it. <laughs> I hope I was able to wrap centuries of history as succinctly and as respectfully as I could. Um, I was very impressed with all of that data. <laughs> when you look at the numbers of, um, you know, the numbers of farmers that we had and what we have now and the acreage that we lost, I mean, that's all very interesting. So thank you so much for sharing. That was good yeah. information. My pleasure. And I'll say, I'll share some sources that I found in um, the chat, including videos I've been, you know, re watching religiously on YouTube, <laughs> um, a speech from Martin Luther King about the land grant system and the structures that basically benefited white immigrants that were coming into the United States versus black people who were already here. It's wild, but I'll share all those sources um, in the comments for those who wanna learn more and get more context. Um, with that said, we'll segue back to Ms. Washington to give some background mm -hmm. on the National Black Growers Council. Thank you. Uh, before we, let me just read one paragraph to continue, uh, Ms. Simmons, what you have provided in terms of background. Um, several factors have contributed to the decline of Black-owned farms in the United States. Federal programs and policies that excluded Blacks from land purchases. The absence of legal protection such as wills that could help facilitate transfer of property to the next generation. Air property, as many of you know, is a big issue today. Um, limited access to capital through discriminatory lending practices through USDA. Taken together, the inability of Black Americans to fully participate in the land market has resulted in a lost opportunity for generational wealth creation, an issue that mirrored the relationship between the U.S. Department of Agriculture and minority farmers. 
the black farmers who have managed to hold on to their farms eke out a living today. Many black farmers operate at 70% 70, 70 of US peer level farms revenue with a 14% operating margin gap uh, versus peers before government payment. Um, now over 100 years later, people of color, as Ms. Summer just mentioned, are leading a resurgence of interest in farming. And yet for these farmers, the barrier to starting a farm remains high. And we can get into a little bit more of that in a minute. Between lending discrimin discrimination and rising costs, many obstacles stand in the way of Black Americans looking to invest in farming. And then I can get into why we created the National Black Growers Council, given that history and that background. Uh, can I share my screen? If I'm allowed to share my screen. Yes, absolutely, you can. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is it now, is it been, what, let me go back to the, hold on a second. Uh, I just, I have a PowerPoint that, um, okay, here we go, share. Okay. Can you guys see the screen? Okay. Coming Let me up. go back up to, I'm yeah, just going to give there. a very quick overview yes, of the yes. National Black Growers Council. Okay. Yep. Um, just a bit of background. As uh, it was mentioned earlier, traditionally, and I think I mentioned this, I think you mentioned it as well, Ms. Simmons, especially when it comes to Ghana, for example, even in the United States, families work together to farm. That's what we did. Uh, you had one tractor, that tractor was used by the neighbors, the friends, everybody. So you may have one person with a, a tractor and that person went around uh, plowing up everybody's field. You have maybe one person, even when I grew up picking kind, we all worked together. Once my family had, we were landowners. So we would consider my entire community that I grew up was all black, all landowners. The people in my family and the community in general believed in investing in land and education. And education, not necessarily going to get a college degree. But my great grandparents all focused on owning land, investing in land, and learning a trade of some sort. If you're going to be a farmer, you're a good farmer. If you're going to be a mechanic, you're a daggone good mechanic. You can go to college, but uh, you had to learn um, how to support yourself in life, be whatever it is. And you succeed at whatever that is. So. Traditionally, Black farmers all worked together. We shared equipment, we shared markets, we let each other know what was going on. We shared, if you had a, a problem with bow weavers, we all got together to figure out how to get those bow weavers out of your cotton field. So traditionally, we worked as through the extension agents, through clubs, and we shared um, um, all, of, all of our wealth and everything else in terms of equipment. Um, the National Black Growers Council was formed sort of based on that history. Um, but before the organization was formed as National Black Growers Council, Monsanto, in 2018, there was a guy named uh, Dwayne Goldman, who actually now works for the secretary. Dwayne was working with the Monsanto along with a couple other Blacks. There were the few in those organizations. Uh, Monsanto asked Dwayne Goldman to identify some black farmers who grew row crops. And he did, and it was the first time these black farmers ever came together as a group. And they, um, or is that me or somebody need to go on mute? I just hear background. Um, and they came together in St. Louis. There were 10 black farmers. It was the first time that they had ever met and did not realize that there were other black farmers in the United States with five, 10, 15,000 acres. And it was the first time that they had met each other uh, from Texas all the way up through Virginia. And based on a couple of meetings with that group as an advisory group to Monsanto, they decided to create their own organization in 2010 called the National Black Growers Council as a 501c. Um, their mission is to improve the efficiency, productivity, and sustainability of black row crop farmers. Now, when we talk row crops, we're talking corn, soybeans, <laughs> uh, Ms. Simmons mentioned millet and sorghum, um, which you know, of our black farmers don't necessarily grow a lot of millet and sorghum, but rice, cotton, peanuts, sugar cane. That's what we've referred to as row crop farmers, everything but cattle or vegetables 
of forestry, but the hardcore uh, commodities such as rice and corn. All farmers tend to be between 200 to 15,000 acres. So they're large, I mean, extremely large groups of farmers. Uh, and so we sort of have that niche on row crop farmers in terms of the National Black Growers Council. Whenever I mention vegetables, I have some members who just don't even want to go there with the vegetables and specialty crop. But um, so that is our niche is row crop farmers. And we grow farms through networking and information sharing among ourselves. Uh, we produce, um, we partner and we do partner with the large agro businesses. If you are planting, even if it's 200 acres of soybeans, you're using chemical. That I mean, unfortunately, it's just a way of life. And you're using a certain type of seeds and you cannot grow any real crops at that level without using or interacting with the agribusinesses. We advocate for black row crop farmers, locally, state, and nationally. I've been on the Hill with some of our board members three times uh, on the Hill, literally speaking with congressmen about the new farm bill. I helped draft the our priorities in terms of the new farm bill, which of course many of you know did not happen. It has not passed. So then um, it's gonna get back on the dis discussion table next year in Congress, but we have advocated to, to continuing supporting um, HBCUs, continue to set aside additional funding for historically underserved limited resource fa farmers. Um, continue to recognize historically there's still an issue within a farm service agency and all the other U.S. government, USDA programs and not make the assumption that everything is fair and equitable. The reality is not. Um, but we do advocate for equity. Uh, we advocate for additional set-asides that can, um, can, uh, can um, make farming within our community more profitable and sustainable. Uh, we do support the next generation of farmers. So we work very closely with the uh, universities, historically under um, uh, HBCUs with their various ag departments. Um, we do have mentoring programs because as I don't know, if, uh, Ms. Simmons mentioned the average age of a farmer today in the United States is 58, if I'm not mistaken. Among our farmers is more like 63, 64. So across the nation, farmers are getting older. So we're looking at how do we retain this current number of Black farmers in the United States? Because those numbers nationwide, the, the number of farmers are, 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 are going down. If you look at the most recent census, I don't have, I think we lost 425,000 farmers over the last 20 years. That's across the board. And we've lost, I think I have the numbers. I just heard Secretary Vilsack speak the other day. And um, I think it's like 10 million acres of agricultural land that has been lost to development. Um, MBGC, I think I mentioned um, how we're structured. We have a board of directors, um, they're 12. And if you can see the screen, we're our board members go from Arkansas all the way up to Virginia. We have 12 active board members and to, today there are 11 active board members. 12 is the max, is the most that uh, we have serving on the board at any given time. All of our board members are row crop farmers. You have to be a farmer in order to be a board member. Um, we have a staff, we're recruiting. Anybody's looking for a job, please let me know. We're still recruiting now. You can take my job as a program assistant director, but we're recruiting for technical staff. Uh, we are small staff right now, but with the resources we're getting and the new programs that we're managing, we are now, trying to increase, we just, our staff, we now have a permanent executive director who just came on board two weeks ago and she'll be officially announced next week. Uh, she's coming out of Southern University, uh, Dr. Don Million, M-E-L-L-I-O-N. So she'll be our new full-time executive director. Um, and we have three other staff members. Our, our, our farmers are, of course, our primary group that we support. I'm uh, mostly row crop farmers. Uh, we have sustaining members. Farmers are members. It's twenty-five dollars a year to become a, a member uh, from the farmer from the farmers um, 
group. We have sustaining members and it's all, as I mentioned, it's all the industry, all the ag um, agro industries across the board from John Deere to Case to Bears, Agenda, Cargill, ADM across the board. Uh, they do pay so much a different level of membership for the sustaining members. And that's how the organization has been functioning uh, up until the last couple of years where we've gotten additional resources. But we also have what we call supporting members. These are folks from um, the universities or just friends of, of farmers. So that's what we make up in terms of our organization. But our membership, it is a membership organization, farmers and sustaining members. Uh, our, we developed uh, last year a uh, five-year strategic plan and our vision in terms of our plan is to be a primary, a premier farmer organization advocating for and supporting primarily black row crop farmers. And I say primarily because some of the funding that we have gotten from USDA is to support all historically underserved farmers and not just black row crop farmers. And our mission is to improve the efficiency, productivity, and sustainability of, of um, primarily row crop farmers. Um, our goals, when goal one, Catalyst for Change, is basically advocating for for um, for change within the, the farming community or sustaining the farmers community. We do network and train farmers, and I get into how we train farmers in terms of our our, our programs for the networking and training, and we try to connect our farmers to markets. And market is a big deal when you're talking. Well. For row crops, the market may be somewhat limited, unlike specialty cropped and vegetables and so forth. Um, uh, our successes in 2023, um, our, we promote technical support. We promote working smarter and being aggressive adopters of technology and conservation practices. That's why we spend a lot of time promoting new technologies and conservation practices, including input from seeds to crop protection in terms of chemical to new equipment. And we try to establish mentors, ap apprenticeships, and internship programs. Um, we work very closely with the university extension and the technical uh, team of all the different um, uh, all the different chemical companies and and uh, equipment companies and so forth. Our approach is we do something similar to what the extension does is model farm field days. We choose a farmer and we select that farm at the beginning of the year. I'm just gonna go to the next slide. This is from last year. I didn't put in a new slide for this year, but we have what is called model farm field days. And if you can see this slide last year in 2023, which is pretty much the same that we did in 2024, there was one, two, three, four, there were six. Tana, Alabama, the bridge fort. We focus on crop protection, very, very uh, variety trials of cotton, corn, and soybeans. Uh, on his farm, we actually demonstrated, John Deere brought out a $800,000 sprayer to demonstrate that sprayer. Our philosophy is if you're doing it on the white folks' farms, demonstrate those, those that technology on black folks' farms. That's what we promote. If you're doing it on that farm as an $850,000 sprayer, why not come and test that sprayer on a black person's farm? And they've been doing it. Bridge Fort has probably the largest black kind farmer in the United States. He's in, in Alabama. Bridge Fort has gotten to the point where they're now selling their kind and getting a premium price. They, uh, if you go in any target, especially January, February, during Black History Month, you're gonna see t-shirts with a tag that says grown, kind grown on a, on the bridge for our farm, which is basically a, um, a African-American farm. And you get that whole story of how the bridge for it. I think they're now in their fourth or fifth generation farmers in Alabama. Um, we also went to uh, Georgia, uh, the Jabs Farm, where we focused on corn, wheat, and cotton, um, Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, and South Carolina. Even though this was last year, these were pretty much the same location, not the same farmer, 
At the beginning of the year, we asked for anyone who would like to host a field day. And we literally, when we say host a field day, we literally mean standing in the field. This is what we do. We literally stand in the middle of the field and we discuss that crop, that variety, and farmers come from all over. That's why we go to different states so that we can capture sort of regional. And they stand there and they're trained, or not trained, but they can ask questions. They can look at the, the variety of seeds. They can uh, touch, feel, ask questions. That's that 850,000 spread that you're looking at at the very bottom there. And they actually, in this case, this was like April. This was early on in the year. So what you don't see is a lot of, his was in May. So you don't see a lot of vegetables, vegetation out there at that moment because it's still early in the season. So we started in May. Most of the farmers don't want you to come to their field in May because they're still planting up all the way through. Um, the last one is generally September. Um, by then, you know, it's almost getting to the point of harvesting. So this is sort of our niche. This is what we do. But we also do training and classroom training. That's why we this year, we hosted four regional in, in classroom training. And when we say training in the classroom, the technical is what you see out in the field. But when we go into the classroom training, that's where we talk about all the USDA programs across the board, across the board. And that's when we have, we invite all the USDA partners to come. Uh, if, you're in, in rural, if you're interested in rural development programs, there's someone there. And we go through every one of the programs all USDA programs have to offer, from Farm Service Agency to Natural um, NRCS, uh, National Conservation Resource Center, NRCS. My acronym might not be, what is it, NRCS, National Conservation Resource Center, Service. Uh, Rural Development, uh, RMA, Risk Management Agency, all these organizations have programs. And I keep telling all farmers, we're, we're leaving money on the table. We literally are leaving thousands and thousands of dollars on the table because these programs exist. So that is one of the things MBGC does is inform farmers. We do a lot of one-on-one. -on -one. We do a whole lot of handholding. Uh, I give my card out to everyone I see. If you want me to walk you down to the Foreign Service Agency, help you complete that 30 page uh, loan application, I will. For equipment, for um, operation, it doesn't matter. I will walk you through that process. If you wanna become a new and beginner farmer or a new farmer, I will walk you through the process of how to register to become a producer with a producer number. Um, and that's basically our financial resources. Of course, I mentioned the membership, but we have the, um, the membership brings in a lot of money uh, and that's what we've been operating on for the last few years. But more recently, we have gotten two grants, one from NIFA, it's a million dollars over five years to promote all USDA programs. And then we have a Climate Smart Grant, which is close to $5 million. Three million of those $5 million go directly to the farmers as incentive payments to adopt certain Climate Smart um, technologies. We just signed 25 farmers. Our limit for this program is 125 farmers total. We just selected 25 farmers. Once they enroll and give us all the information and agree to implement these practices, they got $5,000 just for enrollment fee. And once they do first year, they put all these practices and the practices are practices that they've been doing all along. Crop rotation. Just don't plant the soybeans in the same field. If you're, if you can, if you're growing cotton, soybean and corn, all we're saying is just rotate the fields. Because basically when you rotate your crops, you're, um, you're reducing the amount of diseases and funguses and other by crop rotation. Um, no till, minimum till. If you can minimize your plowing, then that is a practice. Uh, cover crops. Right now, once you harvest your corn, soybeans, rice, whatever it is, put a cover crop. And we will pay you, put, put that cover crop out there. Uh, we pay $140 an acre. And where our maximum acreage is 100. That's $14,000 at the end of the year by incorporating these practices. Uh, cover crop nutrient management. If you start looking at 
doing soil tests and looking at what nutrients you actually need in your field, then there's cost savings and you're not spending money on unnecessary nitrogen or phosphate or whatever it may be by doing the soil testing and letting us explain to you what it means in terms of the deficiency. Um, so those are program is there are $3.1 billion for Climate Smart. It's called Partnership for Climate Smart Commodities. There are 135 entities out here that are getting this money. There are groups that we also work with. ADM has $80 million. And every one of these grants, U.S. Rice, ADM, Virginia Tech, across the board, there are 135 grantees out here. Every one of these grants says you have to provide at least 40% of those resources to underserved, limited resource, historically underserved farmers. Now, when, uh, now when we say uh, underserved, that could be new and beginner farmer. They consider a new and beginner farmer someone who's been farming less than 10 years. That's everybody across the board. Uh, historically, underserved tend to be Blacks and Hispanics or Native uh, Americans. Uh, historically underserved. Um, there are other groups under uh, underserved, veterans, women across the board. But we are promoting that historically underserved. Right now, U.S. Rice, Ducks Unlimited got see the 80 or $90 million uh, for rice farmers. We have identified... Rice farmers, there are six states that grow rice in the U.S. Arkansas is number one for rice production. We have tried to identify every doggone rice, black rice farmer in Arkansas, Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas. We haven't found one yet in California. <laughs> but Arkansas being the biggest state with, for rice farmers, we only identify 25 black rice farmers. But we're making sure every one of those rice farmers are signing up on this project. So if you're enrolled in any other programs, and if you got rice and soybeans and corn, we're telling our black farmers, hold those rice fields to enroll in these other programs that are 100% only rice. And don't put that rice field in other programs because you can get up to $100,000 under the U.S. rice program for historically underserved farmers to put in rice bins. You make more money by being able to store your rice on your farm and to try to reduce the moisture. Most of our black farmers cannot retain that rice on the farm in terms of storage. So we get a lower price when we sell our rice because of the high moisture level. So to, to ensure that black farmers can get a higher rate for their rice in terms of uh, per bushel payments, we are now that program is giving farmers $100,000 put rice bins on their farm. Now, rice band is $250,000 for one. So now we're saying, okay, if a farmer gets the $100,000, we will work with that farmer to go to farm service agency to get a loan, equipment loan, or to commercial banks. You go to a commercial bank, we still want FSA to guarantee that loan. So those are, what else is there? I mentioned the model farm field days. I think that's it. And I am open for any questions you may have. Okay. Um, you want to stop your share? You want me to do it for you? Oh, I can stop. Okay. okay. All right. White women are underserved in these situations funding their <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Reading the, yeah, that, reading that's the, what uh, happens. They, the they, conveniently be, <laughs> they conveniently become minorities. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah. Yep. So um, I see. What um, is TNT? Oh, okay. Ten, uh, Trinidad and uh, okay. Uh, do you have banking or or a savings and loan association or alliance with any financial institution? Uh, no, we don't. Um, but we do work with, we try to work, we try to work primarily with Foreign Service uh, uh, FSA, Foreign Service um, Agency. Uh, they are the ones that give, this is USDA. Um, the the um, administrator of Foreign Service Agency, which is the USD agency providing loans and grants, very few grants, but mostly loans for operating, uh, operating and um, equipment. Um, 
when I came back and I went to farm and I had gotten a hoop house uh, from uh, NRCS, a greenhouse um, and the irrigation system and so forth. And then I went over to um, FSA to get an operating loan. Microfinance loan is a streamlined process and it's only like a three or four page application. Um, so I went and I applied to get an operating loan from my vegetable farming. And the guy says to me, and he was a black guy. In fact, I knew Greg. He went to school at UAPB. He said, well, I need a marketing plan. Fine. I know it's not required, but I will give you a marketing plan. Um, so I did the marketing plan, went back to himself the next day, and he read it. And he said, where you get all these prices? In a budget. I said, where you get all these prices for? And how do you come up with your average you know, what you're going to sell your tomatoes for, cucumbers or whatever. I said, and where'd you get your yield data? And I explained where I got my yield data from, how I came up with my my budget, the price that I was going to sell my 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 vegetables. And um, I said, I went to the farmer's market. I went to Walmart, Kroger's, and I came up with an average price that the market, and I'm like, I'm selling in my community. So I don't want, you know, I, I want it to be somewhat uh, competitive what they could go to Walmart and buy. And he says, so you're selling farm to school, <laughs> farmer's market, individuals, restaurants, grocery stores. Um, and he says, so you're peddling your vegetable. I'm like, excuse me, I'm doing what? It's like the audacity of you to say I'm peddling. These are vegetables. And I said, your own secretary of agriculture, Vilsack promotes farmer's market. And he him and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, well, you know, I'm going to have to take your land. I'm like, dude, you are out of your doggone mind now. It ain't happening. And I said, you know what? I'm out of here. And I said, I'm going to call Washington, D.C. on the state of Arkansas because you clearly do not understand what microfinance means. You asked me for all this additional information. I gave it to you. And, um, and he, he says, I don't report to D.C. I report to Little Rock. I'm like, I don't care who you report to. But... This is just not acceptable. So I got a telephone number, I called DC, talked to the person who manages the microfinance program. And he said, well, how much are you asking for? $300,000? I'm like, no, $10,000, $10,000. And fast forward two days later, Miss Washington, come sign your loan. Well, thank you, Mr. Smith, I appreciate it. So what I have learned over the years, I don't take no for an answer. When they did not want to give me my well, I found out who the state well engineer was. And I called him, I said, I have a hoop house sitting in the middle of the field. There's no access to water. So I'm calling you to find out how do I get water underneath all this plastic into my crops? He said, I said, because your team in Crane County refused to uh, authorize a well. I said, now I'm calling you as the engineer for irrigation and well to tell me how am I gonna get water in this plant, in this hoop house or greenhouse without a well. Fast forward two days later, come sign your, your grant for your well. This is what I've been encouraging a lot of our black farmers. Be respectful, be diplomatic, but do not take no for an answer. Have them to explain to you why. Have them to put it in writing to you, where Greg never would put in writing my no. This is what they do at FSA. They will not tell you no, and they were hoping that you would go away and not come back. This is what they do. So my thing is be insistent. Don't take no for an answer. But again, don't burn the bridges because I don't want to burn the bridges because I know I need them more than they need me. But I'm not going to take no for an answer. And this is what I'm trying to encourage our people. But some people have been burned so many times, they do not want to go back to those offices. But everything that I've ever wanted, I got. Uh, they call me now with new programs when they're about to expire. But I also tell all Black farmers to develop a, a relationship with all your USD colleagues. When you see them in the grocery store, just say, hey, how you doing? Oh, I want to come by your office on Monday. Uh, do you have time for me? Or do you have a minute now to talk about it? You know, I'm interested in that equip program. I stop folks, I don't care where they are. If I know they work in a certain office, it's like, oh, hey, Mr. So-and-so, I've been planning to come visit you. But 
there are a lot of opportunities out there and you're right about the underserved, including white women. And that's oftentimes what we're doing the advocacy. We want to exclude that group because if you include that group, they go to the top of the, the chain and they get all the money. And by the time they get to us, there are no money left for the program. So we're making sure that for our group, that they are considered first in terms of disbursement of funding. Uh, what's your position on GMO seeds? If you're growing 15,000 acres of sorbage, you're using GMO seeds. Um, do I have a position on it? <sighs> Working overseas in several countries, the European market versus the U US market, there's a lot of controversy on GMO. My thing is growing up in the agriculture sector is no different than hybrids. When you crossbreed certain types of uh, plant to reduce the amount of the amount of diseases, the amount of funguses, the limitation of water usage, some of those things. If you didn't have special type of GMO type seeds, the amount of chemicals would be even more so. So my take on that is another form of of genetic type of breeding, if you will. I'm not an expert on GMO, so I don't want to get into that level of details, but I do know that the, some of those varieties, you do minimize the diseases. If you go and buy a tomato seed, look at that tomato seed, and it's going to say something like resistant to A, B, C, and D, if you want that seed. Or you can get pure organic seed, but when you do some of those seeds, the, the risk of diseases and funguses and so forth are even greater. Um, I want to address the food desert and urban art. <laughs> urban yeah, we, have two we have two yeah. hands up, Miss Washington. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I'll, okay. I'll just read it. She can just read that. That's, um, that's what I had my hand up about. But go ahead and finish reading. Because that's what I wanted to ask oh, you about. Okay. So that's Keith's question. So go ahead. What's the question you were reading? Uh, I wanted to address the food deserts in urban America. This required vegetables. Do you help vegetable farmers in New Jersey? I will, sir. You, I will give you my name and number and you call me because USDA programs are nationwide. It doesn't matter what state you're in. It really doesn't. Now, some well, states conservation may be different than others, but every one of the USDA programs are nationwide, including New Jersey. I just don't well, know any farmers in New Jersey. So you'll be our I, first. I'll be the first. Okay. And it'll be a pleasure. I will absolutely call you and, and continue this. I'm very excited about this. Thank you. Yeah, there was a guy <laughs> from New Jersey who I, he was supposed to be on this call, but I don't think I sent him the information timely enough. And he's a New Jersey farmer too. So I'll definitely put him in touch with you as well. Um, there was another telephone thing. Number. Okay. Oh, wait, let me go back to that question though about um, yesterday. I was in, in Hershey, Pennsylvania with USDA for the Climate Smart Initiatives, right? And um, someone commented that we are some of the largest producer of food in this country, in the world. But when I look at row crops, those are ingredients. Those are not food. Soybean is not a food for me. It's an ingredient. You can't walk out in the field and eat a corn, well, maybe some sweet corn, but for the most part, uh, rice has to be processed. Corn has to be processed to some degree, uh, unless it's sweet corn. Um, uh, soybean, rice, wheat for bread, they, they're an ingredient, if you ask me. Now, when it comes to vegetables, vegetables for me is food, because you can walk out and eat a tomato, a cucumber, right. uh, even okra, uh, sweet mm -hmm. potatoes. Those are um, what I mentioned earlier about MBGC board is primarily row crop farmers, but because of these resources we get from USDA, we have to work with any farmer who comes for assistance. I grow vegetables. Um, I'm trying to be naturally grown because I will never be organically, but those food deserts are a reality. Uh, urban, not only urban now, you could have food desert in the rural area too because the closest grocery store could still be 10, 15 miles from you. And the way society has gone, you don't have a whole lot of backyard um, gardens anymore. So people tend to eat at the 7-Eleven, the, the, you know, where you can get coin chips and all that stuff. 
So we're really, really trying to promote uh, naturally grown, not naturally grown, but we're trying to promote eating fresh, uh, local. Uh, I have a trailer that I got to harvest to to move my um, my vegetables. Uh, we just got a grant. I'm a member of a cooperative, a food, uh, a vegetable cooperative, and uh, we got ten thousand dollars from an organization to convert my trail and transform that trail into a a farmers a mobile farmers market. Mm -hmm. The guy is in the process now put it in a coal unit within the trailer. We're buying this organization is buying locally from from farmers right there uh in two counties in Mississippi. They're buying from the farmers and then with this money that they get, they got another fifteen thousand dollar grant so they can buy fresh fruits and vegetables locally and they're distributing not a food bank, but they're stripping in certain communities within two counties of Mississippi. And they're making this distribution twice a week. There's a lot of push right now from USDA to give state money to buy locally and give that food to Food Hub for distribution. That is now in Southern states, Mississippi, Arkansas. Arkansas got $12 million. I was asked to provide food to families of 500 that they feed once a week. So there is a growing um, understanding that you got these food deserts, not only in urban, but also in rural areas where people are not eating fresh fruits and vegetables. Do and I'm gonna put an my number hey. do, you, do you see an association between food deserts and gentrification? Well, being in rural Arkansas, I don't see that. Maybe someone else does. I don't. I I don't know the association. Maybe someone else on the call. Yeah, I just find it quite interesting that the inner cities, which are being gentrified, um, the that's one of the tactics they use. That's definitely one of the. That's definitely one of the tactics that they use when they want to reclaim that urban area. They'll make sure there's no food. Make sure it's unlivable on a lot of levels. And then they'll come back and reclaim it for pennies on the dollar. Yeah, so they Absolutely. do use that. Wow. They deprive, deprive the community of services. And to deprive the community of food is pretty um, awful. Um, Ms. Um, Bay, you have a question? Yes, um, uh, Helen. And, and uh, uh, thank you um, for taking my uh, question. And respect, 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 uh, Ms. Washington, um, to all the work that you are doing. This it, we have been here in Philadelphia, um, ever since uh, the days of um, uh, uh, old time uh, radio host Georgie Woods. We have been ad adamant on on the um, path of the black, the survival of the black farmer. Um, and here in Philadelphia, we do a big campaign um, every summer when the black farmers are bringing the produce because we are in dire need of seeded seeded watermelons and we break our necks to get to the black farmers coming into the city and that and that is my concern i hear you saying that you don't uh know that much in reference to the gmo but it has to be equally as important as the funding that you're getting because it does no good right now i'm sitting when i go to cook I'm mm -hmm. using baking soda to wash my vegetables with, okay? okay. I'm being taking mm -hmm. special care to make sure mm -hmm. I buy something. I don't eat anything that doesn't have seeds in it, okay? okay. I'm, I'm making okay. special care. Now I'm mm -hmm. being prompted to get a nitrate detector to stick into mm -hmm. the vegetables to see how many nitrates are in there. So mm -hmm. bottom line, it does no good all of this hard work that you're doing um, and us trying to uh, 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 focus on the survival of our Black farmers, if or when we sit down at the table, we're killing ourselves and sending ourselves to the doctor and inheriting all kinds of cancers. So we have, I mean, we've been eating food ever since there's been uh, human beings on the earth. I don't understand how we get to a point here today where we have a chemical called appeal, that even if you touch that chemical on the fruits and vegetables, it goes into your 
your skin and it cannot be washed off of the um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> vegetables. So I don't want to tax you uh, with uh, too much of this because you, you stated that you didn't know that much about the GMO. But I just want to be able to voice this so that maybe you can take that message to the folks that you're dealing with to let them know mm -hmm. that we the people, we have to have foods that help us to live and not help to send us to the doctor. Mm -hmm. Can you put your contact in the chat for me? Yes, I will. And then I'll follow up with you. Uh, you mentioned nitrate. Um, I am very concerned about sodium nitrate in, in certain meat because my family has a history of pancreatic cancer. So when it comes to sodium nitrate, I am definitely um, cold cuts, things like that, I'm I'm really conscious of. When you mentioned GMO and seeds, I don't grow anything that doesn't have seeds in it. God bless. I mean, my watermelon is seeded, my tomatoes are seeded. Everything I grow, it has seeds in it. God so bless. I don't grow anything that does not have seeds. Um, I want to yeah, go back um, to the urban farming real quick. Go ahead, um, that's what I'm just gonna so ask you guys to know that urban farming is now a unit to some degree within USDA. They've now realized that urban farming is very essential in 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 metropolitan area. USDA now is focusing and has program just for urban farming, including loan opportunities. Now, um, if you want to become a farmer, you only need 0.5, a tenth of an acre. That's a backyard, a tenth of an acre. That's it. You just need, you only have one thing. You have to have access to that tenth of an acre. That's a backyard in some places. So I've been encouraging people in the urban area, if you have a backyard, you want to do some backyard farming and you got 10th of an acre, go down to the nearest farm service agency and there's one in every county. Some in the more metropolitan area, there may be more combined counties at a, in, in terms of USDA center. Um, and the only thing you need either is a deed to your land or a lease agreement. That's it a deed or a lease agreement saying that you have access to land. That's the first thing is access to a minimum of a 10th of an acre. And you can register as a producer, as a wow. farmer, even in the urban areas. That's good. You know. And I've been encouraging people to go. If you've been doing backyard farm, you got a little excess or you want to um, enroll in some of these USDA programs, even if you're doing it for home consumption, that's fine. Even though they say for tax purposes, you have to sell at least $1,000, I think, something like that. Um, but, you know, there are programs within USDA for urban farming now. So I'm encouraging people in the urban area to go and register as a producer if you have access to a tenth of an acre of land. Okay. Before we go to the next question, because I know Samanetta is going to have to leave soon. Tell us a little bit more about the work that you do with USDA and how can people on this call support your work um, and that of farmers before you go, if you don't mind. You're muted. I'm sorry, was that question for me? Yes. I mean, I'm sorry. Have... I'm yeah. sorry, the noise got a little, can you please repeat that last part? I was saying, I know that you have to go. So I wanted yes. you to talk a little bit more about exactly what you do at USDA mm -hmm. and how people on this call can support the efforts that you um, have put forth. Kelson, I see you and I see you too, Miss Grace. And LaShawn yes. is on this call. I heard all about you, LaShawn. I hope that you will chime into this conversation as well. Mm -hmm. But anyway, Simon, so tell us a little bit more about what you do and yeah. how lay people can support what you do. Right. Um, in, to per, in terms of supporting what I do personally, I, I, I can't really say, there. but okay. because what we do is we essentially try to open up markets overseas for U.S. agriculture. And so that encompasses all, you know, all U.S. farmers and their constituents. Um, 
including cooperators, including cooperatives, including big ag. Um, so it's not specific to any you know particular group. I just personally um, got interested in the National Black Growers Association um, just out of doing my own research and then came across this organization. And this particular administration is invested in trying to be more engaged with minority farmers and cooperatives and businesses. Um, and so as part of our DEI initiative, we've been trying to collaborate more with uh, minority farmers and see where those gaps can be filled, um, where those pain points can be filled, for example, in, in you know, with USDA's um, addressing the years of discrimination that um, Black farmers particularly have faced through grants. Um, but, you know, we are seeking to become more engaged with Black farmers, with minority farmers, and also work to sort of try to help them expand their markets overseas by connecting them to suppliers or um, individuals outside of the country who are interested in sourcing agricultural products from the United States. Um, so that's really government to government, really. And so in terms of like supporting me personally, you know, I, I don't see, but I think it's more so how do we start by supporting Black farmers in our own communities? whether it's patronizing from them, buying directly from them. I know in our, in my immediate community, just right here, we have a couple black owned farms just within an hour or two from me. Um, we have one farm, Silvaqua Farms. I'll, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but I'll share. Um, and this is a poultry farmer and he sells eggs, chickens, um, meat products that you can buy directly from him on his farm. Um, their Sankofa farms, I think that's coming out of South Carolina. So it's just supporting farmers in your immediate community. I think that's the best way that we can support. Um, because as they scale, they can also provide more of their products to even restaurants or different service providers in their immediate community and then grow and scale um, and scale their businesses and reinvest in their businesses. So that's that's just what I'm thinking off the top of my head. I don't know if Ms. Washington would be able to add to that. I know that in previous conversations, she mentioned um, volunteering in community gardens, um, being hands-on in your direct community. Um, uh, share in terms of the international market or more the domestic market? Because I mean, you it work could be in the international both. market. Right. I, I I work on the international side where we're trying to expand U.S. agriculture overseas um, through right. a myriad of ways, whether it's addressing technical barriers to trade. And that's from the policy perspective. You know, you may have a country that's not GMO friendly. Um, we right. we are at the table trying to get them <laughs> to at least understand the science behind I mean, we're not forcing them officially, right? But um, but giving them the information, explaining the science behind it, bringing agriculturalists from their countries, often in the public sector, to the United States to partner with our institutions like, you know, like NAS, like um, uh, off the top of my head, I'm sorry, my 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 brain is 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 kind of meshed. Sunday, uh, you're different about to turn agencies, it off. different agencies without the United within the United States that handle the issue of GMOs and other other mm -hmm. issues that prevent us from being able to trade. Um, and mm -hmm. so so we address it from the policy angle. Um, and in terms of like on the private side, it's really working directly with suppliers who are interested in purchasing ag products um, and shipping overseas and sort of establishing those relationships um, and connecting them to to different markets. Um, but on a domestic front, I mean, I know personally what I do is I, I seek out um minority farmers, black farmers at my local farmer's market, or I will drive <laughs> to go find them <laughs> and and see if I can patronize their products, eggs, poultry, whatever they supply. And that's my little way of contributing to, to them because if they don't have consumers, they don't have people that are buying their products, how do we expect their businesses to grow and for them to reinvest and scale? Exactly. 
Exactly. Um, Marcella, your, your hand has been up for a minute. Did you have a question, Marcella? Ms. Graves? Oh, yes, I want to ask a question. Is it too late to apply for the funding of the, uh, the money they have for farmers? I'm asking for my uncle. Which, uh, to apply for a, which it program? It was, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was for the uh, black farmers money. That di discrimination? Yes. Yeah, yes, that closed January 17th this, this year. So those funds have been dispersed. My understanding that there's not a second round, but there might be. I don't want to say there won't be, but to my understanding right okay. now, there are no immediate plans to have a second round. I think it was about $2.1 billion okay. that was dispersed. And I think Ms. Summers That's mentioned that. The largest group that... We did. I'm sorry. No, I'm just listening. The group that got the most money was in Mississippi and Alabama. Oh, okay. And those funds were <laughs> a couple of thousand dollars to almost a half a million. Because we're in so, California. Right now, pardon? She's in California, she said. I'm not sure. You can go on, you can go on the website. It's called um it's called uh two zero zero seven. Two okay. USDA two zero zero two triple zero seven. And that's that okay. di discrimination okay. website. Uh, okay, but it's called you. the discrimination or something. But I think on that website, they now provide all the details of not names of individuals who receive, but the amount of money that was dispersed, if I'm not mistaken, in the state. Okay, and, thank you so and much. And 80% of those funds went primarily to, to Black farmers or landowners. The other 20% went to Hispanics and other underserved individuals. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Grace. Uh, Kelson, you had a question, and then Caroline. Go ahead, Kelson. Uh, yes, I wanted to uh, to ask Ms. Washington. Well, thank both of you for uh, for presentation. But I wanted to ask Ms. Washington, uh, in terms of urban farming, is there any initiative uh, to uh, act on a smaller scale? So, for example, I live in Brooklyn in New York. And uh, on my block, I'm pretty sure that uh, most of the um, the homeowners have backyards, um, but they may not be engaged in uh, in backyard farming. Are there any initiatives coming out of um, out of your program to work with um, with uh, people block by block to establish backyard uh, farms so that? you know, at least the block can feed itself. You know, people can get fresh uh, vegetables uh, on that block, you know, and change the way people begin to eat and think and act on that block. And then that could become a broader uh, movement. Is there something like that? Yes, there are. There are several. Uh, they call community gardening. Mm -hmm. uh, there are two entities that you can contact. One is your local extension service every state through its university state university systems have what they call extension service within that extension service entity uh they have community gardeners they have uh 4-h uh organizations or 4-h is a is a sort of a you you city folks know the boys and girls club well, I didn't grow up in the city. I grew up in the country. They call them 4 H. <laughs> That's the rule of the equivalent. And future farmers of America. Uh, those are mostly for kids. But your local extension agency tend to be involved in community uh, gardening. In addition to that, the um, NRCS, USDA, NRCS, Natural Resources Conservation Service. They also involved in urban farming and community gardening. So those are the two entities. Even if you are in Brooklyn, New York, um, there should be a USDA office somewhere near Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. Somewhere near Brooklyn. 
because urban farming is becoming such a growing um, interest in, in metropolitan areas, uh, urban farming is really now being promoted within USDA and the Extension Service. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Ms. Hunter, Caroline, you're muted babe. Yes, good evening, everybody. Helen, thank you so much for this discussion. I just happen to be in Montgomery, Alabama, where um, I must say it's been a rough day. We visited the lynch lynching memorial today. Oh. Uh, and I would encourage everyone, especially anybody who doesn't think they know why they should vote, to come to Montgomery, visit the Legacy Museum, visit the, mm -hmm. visit the lynching museum. I don't we, know if I could handle uh, it. We, oh, we okay. traveled mm -hmm. today to Bloody Lowndes County. Uh, we're traveling with the Bowling family where Mr. Bowling was killed because he amassed too much wealth. And his uh, grand, his uh, daughter has uh, put up markers and is changing the environment. Uh, but part of that, um, we celebrated her at a banquet, but the next day we had Nicole Hannah-Jones um, as a guest speaker. Uh, but wow. yesterday we had a forum on the Black farmers and on this call today is LaShawn Wallace, who is um, a native of York, um, Alabama, passionate about farming and reshaping the Black Belt through um, housing, agriculture, education, and workforce development. He believes that a community cannot thrive if it's not healthy, and he facilitates forage programs for UTK through 12 in Sumter County schools and develops after-school programs at his ranch. He plans to open a commercial meat, fruit, and vegetable processing plant and a farmer's market to address food deserts. His group owns 15,000 cattle. Uh, so Mr. LaShawn is a wonderful resource, I think. Be great to have him jump in now. He could fill up the full program. But also on that program, Ms. Washington, was a gentleman. We had two people there from USDA, uh, mm -hmm. and one of them talked about that program that you talked about. He gave the statistics, and then there was another gentleman. Uh, let's see, another gentleman, um, Mr. Nervy Garden, Alabama USDA Agriculture Rural Development. He gave lots of resources. Oh. Uh, and then the other person who was there from USDA was Clifton Waters, who really talked about the settlements. And you're right. We didn't get the demographics of who got the money. We just got the number. But I want to stop talking because I learned an awful lot. Uh, because when we go to local areas, we need to involve them, be involved in what's happening. So I'd like to invite Mr. LaShawn to just talk a little briefly about uh, what he does. So thank you, Helen. And it's so interesting that these things are happening back to back in my life. So, you know, I love you, girl. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hi, Sean. Welcome. Hello. Thank y'all for inviting me. So um, tell us about what you got going on down there. Ooh, she told me she's going to give me about two minutes. I'm going to try to keep it to two minutes because it is a lot. But um, I am a um, combat veteran from the military. I um, um, decided two years ago to get into farming. Um, I mostly specialize in and workforce development. And I use agriculture as a big aspect of it because a lot of people here have land or have lost land that wasn't able to continue to farm. Um, the average farmer here is over the age of 65 and they don't have any help. And the kids was raised to you know, go be a lawyer, go be a doctor. And once they achieve that success, Father, big mama, big daddy are still back at home trying to tend to the land. But unfortunately, their health or living situation or finances or whatever, not in the place where they can still continue to do those things. So I started doing stuff with um, youth. I'm big into, like she was saying, with STEM and 4-H. I'm trying to figure out ways to getting young folks back involved. And those are just the young people. Um, for the people that's already 18 and older that's trying to get into the workforce, I found a way of getting them involved into the agriculture so we can change that. Because I can't see another piece of land in my area get sold and find out you got minerals on your land. And Big Mama, Big Daddy, we 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 done sold this 100 acres for $100,000. And in one day, these folks that came and bought it and made millions off of your land. And that is something that has been on a rise lately due to the fact that all the farmers are passing on are selling their land. And unfortunately, the uneducated are uninformed, not knowing about resources. So I'm trying to combat that. 
Um, I have a group called Wolfers, Worldwide Organizations of Farmers, um, that I'm a part of. I have access to 250 interns that are willing to come and work and farm land. And all you have to do is house them and give them something to eat. And they'll tend to your land. And that's how we're trying to correct it. But I'm also making this a business. In my community, there's not even a grocery store. We have nothing to eat. If I go east, I got to go 17 miles. If I go west, I got to go 35 miles. If I got to go north, that's an hour and something drive. And if I go south, that's 45 minute drive just to get an apple. Now I can get all of the gas station chicken I want, but I can't get any fresh food, fresh vegetables. Um, like the young lady was speaking about non-GMO products and just having good food. It's killing our community. Our health is declining. Our population has shrunk, but high blood pressure, diabetes, sickle cell, mental disorders, lupus, cancer is on a rise. And I believe that comes from what we ingest into our body. And so with the farm that I'm, what I'm doing here on our ranch, everything we're doing is non-GMO and we're figuring out a way to feed the community and also getting them employed. I kind of use like a recycling type thing or a fill of dreams. If you build it, they will come. I get people certified in everything that I'm doing all the way down to heavy equipment, CDL, wastewater, real estate, whatever, because all of that goes together. Um, to me, in my mind, like I do carpentry, plumbing, and electrical, I have certified more people here at my facility in one year than all the community colleges combined in the state of Alabama. And I'm at a 90 something percent employment rate because it still ain't no sense me growing this food if the people around me still can't afford to purchase. So I, well, I still want to meet you. Awesome. You say what now? I still want to meet you. That's impressive. <laughs> And I said, that's awesome. Thank oh, you. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Somebody Thank you. said they want to meet you. I don't know who that was, but they said, I think it was, Keith. was that Keith? That, that was Keith from Jersey. And, and Miss Washington. Okay. So it's you're Jersey. in demand. LaShawn, yeah, so I know you're out walking, but um, can you, uh, 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 Caroline, do you have his information to drop in the chat? Oh, I'm just walking on, on the ranch. I'm fine. But I can take no, all the information. Okay. If you can drop it in the chat, so that would be great. Yeah, because the people, I think what you're doing is fantastic. And I don't know if you were on the um, call when I asked earlier, it, do we think that um, these quote unquote food deserts, I don't even know, how do you call it a food desert? You're depriving people of food. What the hell does that mean, food desert? Um, but is it related to gentrification? And, you know, when we talk about taking people's lands, there's plenty of ways to take people's lands, deprive them of services, and depriving us of food is like high on the list. Uh, which is a segue into this whole air property thing, Miss Washington. What is, and you just touched on it somewhat, um, LaShawn, but what is happening with the air property? We, we're losing our property through what? The issue is that I, I've been dealing with when it comes to this air property situation is the, you got, I'm not sure how it is everywhere else, but down here, Big Mama and Big Daddy had 15 kids. And them 15 kids, none of them are here anymore, besides two or three. And the ones that somewhere else can't come to the terms of everybody else. Like, oh, I don't want to do this on Big Mama Big Daddy Land. I want to hold on to it. Well, you're not here to help take care of it. So if one person disagrees, you can't do you can't do anything besides what the collective agree to. So if one person say no, that's exactly what you're gonna do then. Nothing. And that's what runs into the issue. And then when it finally gets down to everyone having to pass on because some people believe oh I can pass it on to my kids no you can't it's between these people that they originally left it to and that's it until it gets down to one person then when it gets down to that one person if they didn't have their paperwork in order someone went and stood on the steps of the court courthouse paid that two hundred dollars for your two thousand acres and now no one in the family can have it but whoever wow. paid them paid that off and that's what we're running into here I have seen black families here. Like, I can't call the old lady name that lives across from where I'm at now. She had over 2,000 acres. And this is, she had 2,000 acres. The kids couldn't agree on what to do with the land. Nobody paid the property taxes. And these people are still digging coal off that land to this day. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. Yes. But Sean, how far are you from Huntsville? Huntsville, I'm about maybe three hours. 
Oh, okay. I, I knew a brother, um, Hakeem Muhammad, um, out in Huntsville. He only had 13 acres, but I was just curious as to whether he still had his um land. Is that the young um, man that works at Alabama A and L? Uh, his, his his nephew, I think, was at at Alabama um A and M. Was I think he was president or something? Yes, ma'am. I I know exactly which which family you're talking about. Uh huh. Yeah, the Huntley. Huntley. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. They're still there. Well, I know the guy that um the, he does the agriculture for. They didn't move him up in a new position, but yes, ma'am, he's still there. Yeah, I think I think uh, Ms. brother Miss Miss Washington, I want you to talk a little bit about when we spoke the other day. You were saying that these land squabbles happen, and while there is an offer at some point of legal assistance, not mediation. So, can you talk a little bit about that and why you think that's important for these um, air well, situations? Just to to address that and to pick it back on Mr. Wallace there. I know I can be on a plane sitting beside a black person. I could be on a train or a bus, it doesn't matter. Everyone I've ever met has air property issue. Every person you would meet and that I've met has a family member somewhere in the South, mama on land, papa, you know, granddaddy, somebody. Everybody I know has land issues. My family realized that years ago, so we put all of our land in a trust before my grandmother died. Um, so we put in a trust so we can make sure it stays in the family. One of the largest take of land was right here in Arkansas. You guys may have heard about it. It was right in my county. He was killed in 1954 on most of thousands of acres of land was lynched. We were talking about lynching earlier. The family has signs. Everyone wanted to know, does you know anything about the lynching, um, Mr. Burns, from you know 1954? Because they're taking it to court now, Little Rock. Whether they're going to get any of this land back is not sure, but at least they're pursuing trying to get this land back. Um, anyway, the biggest issue for me, basically what Mr. Wallace is saying, is families coming together to have... A lot of there's a lot of money out there right now. There are several groups. There's one in Mississippi dealing with air property. There's one in North Carolina, the Center for Air's Property. There's a center for Air's Property. I think it's out of North Carolina or South Carolina. They cover in several states. The problem with those grants is that when they intervene, they don't bring in the the um the mediators, they don't bring in the social workers. They bring, they come in, but the family has to be on one accord to some degree, at least one accord and a, to listen to their options and then decide on what's the best option fit for that family. But if you've got disruption within the family, they don't even want to sit in the same room. They don't even want to discuss because this person is pissed off at that person, whatever the issue is. There's a lot of that going. FSA, USDA Farm Service Agency, has money available, but it's a loan to deal with land issues. You can get a loan, but that makes absolutely no sense. If you got 50 people who heirs to this land, who's going to go get the loan? Mm -hmm. So we've been advocating with USDA Washington, uh, FSA, make that money a grant and not a loan. So that family could hire the lawyers and everybody else they need to, to resolve the issue. But nobody in the family is going to take out a loan because who's going to do it? Because mm -hmm. nobody got that kind of money or be responsible for dealing with the family issue when there are 50 people involved. So we're promoting getting that as a grant and not as a loan. Um, we are trying to get some of these grants some of those fundings set aside for mediators and social workers or psychologists. Sometimes you need just a bona fide psychologist to sit down with that family to kind of like, okay, one person at a time, let's try to get on the same, uh, same page, the same agenda. That has been one of the biggest issues among our family, all my community, is to sit in the same, I'm dealing with that now in my own family, my immediate family. But one person has moved back. She's on a family farm. It's a house that's like nine years old. In fact, I found out I was born in Mama Matilda's house. The one lady has come back, my cousin. She just wanted that house and one acre in her name so that she can get the grants to fix up the house. 
siblings of 12, five of them have died. So their kids are not part of the heir. The one sibling, my cousin who lives in Arizona, refused to sign the doggone papers. I am so upset with Bunny. I can just like strangle her. What is your issue here? Oh, well, you know, I don't know what made serious, blah, blah, blah. So when we talk about land, we're our own worst enemies. Yes, but my... I do risk that we could have some resources out here to bring in a facilitator to sit down with the person. I'm dealing with the family now, three sisters. One of the sisters won't even come to the doggone table. She doesn't even want to talk about it. And I just don't understand that mentality. I just don't get it. So no, there, there's no appreciation for the fact that if we can't work it out amongst ourselves, some developer is going to get it and all of us are out. That's right. Lost. There's, there's it goes no to way. court and traditionally judges have decided that it's easier to split money than it is to split land. Right. And that's why it goes up to the auctions. And if I don't have a family member who is in a position to bid on that land, it gets sold to the highest bidder. And oftentimes we don't even know it's being auctioned. No, ma'am. We find out after the fact. In my own family, I got two uncles on my grandmother's side that live in California. They both have died. It's only like five acres each. My nephew's farming all of this land. I pay their taxes every year. I'm not taking that chain. For 50 bucks, I'm going to pay the taxes. So we make sure within our own family, even if they're not here, somebody pays that tax every year. And since I'm back home for the last 10 years, I go down every year. I get the list of every everybody I know in my community that I know that they don't have a loved one here in town. I pay their taxes. I don't care if it's 100 bucks, 200 bucks, because I don't want to lose the land. Good for you. You're and an I think more of us are going to have to start doing that. Because it comes out in the paper every year what taxes have not been paid. Mm -hmm. And people are banking on it. Thank you so much. Um, LaShawn, I see you put your information in the chat. Yes, ma'am. Um, and perhaps we'll have you back because it sounds like there's a lot of information and in, I'm a lot of interest in the work that you're doing. So if we can get you one Sunday, you can come on and, and talk about what you're doing and how it can be replicated around the nation or supported, you know, you support it. Um, so thank you so much, Caroline, for looking out for me. You always do. I appreciate you. We got to get the Martha's Vineyard. So if you don't mind, Ms. Washington and Simonetta, there are two more questions, and then I promise I'll let you go. Is that okay? Thanks, LaShawn. You're welcome. Thank you, LaShawn. And I, you're on my list well, LaShawn, now. is that your number? Yes, ma'am. Is that A62? Is that you? I'll be giving you a call, LaShawn, because I want to make sure that you guys all are aware of all these climate smart opportunities that's out here. Yes. All right, that'll work. <laughs> okay. And make sure you get her information too, LaShawn. It's in the chat. I got I'll send it. it to you. Oh, you okay. got it. Okay. Beautiful. All right. Don't leave I was us. in Orangeburg, South Carolina. I was just there about three weeks ago. Somebody was, who's in the chat? It's in Orangeburg. Who is that? Do you see it? Mm -mm. I just saw Orange Bird, South Carolina. Yeah, I think it was Sophia. Is it Sophia? But she's a, oh, she's talking East Orange, New Jersey, or no? Sophia is in East Orange, Orange. New Jersey. Oh, Families no, LG Hampton. LG Hampton is no, from Linda. Linda Hampton. Okay. Yes. It, it's my family, Miss Helen. We we have a, a, an heirs property issue in Orangeburg right now. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's I my. I can give you some contacts for Orangeburg for South Carolina. If you if you got my number, just shoot me an email because that Center for Heirs Property is out of South Carolina. Thank you, I appreciate it. Okay. okay. Go ahead, Mr. Um Kelson, real quick. What's your question? And you're muted. You're muted, Bay. You're muted. You're muted, Kelson. Muted. Okay. okay. I think Ms. Washington uh, spoke uh, to it, but what is concerning me is that as property has been a problem for decades in our mm -hmm. community and the amount of land that we have lost is, is just uh, enormous. 
Yet I don't hear of we have a uh, Miss Washington represents uh, a uh, Black uh, Growers Association, um, but there is no association, uh, national association that is dealing with um, with heirs property to prevent uh, people from losing um, from losing so much land. I mean we know. Places like Hilton Head and so forth. So, you know, people just lost the land. The Gullahs, Gitches has lost enormous amount of land that are now reserves and, and so forth. Um, is there, isn't there, or is there any effort to establish a national organization to go to these communities to um, inform people as to as property and to help them to change uh, you know, write wills. You know, one of the things we don't write wills because we are facing our mortality when we do. Um, mm -hmm. And so we don't write wills and that's part mm -hmm. of the issue uh, that causes mm -hmm. us to lose so much land. Is there any uh, effort to uh, do that? There is. There is out of uh, South Carolina, I think it's out of South Carolina or North Carolina. It's called the Center for Heirs Property. Center for Heirs Property. Uh, her name is Dr. Stevens, was her first name. She manages that, that Center for Heirs Property. They just got awarded $8 million from USDA to, deal, to address this issue. A lot of the universities now have funding, literally a lot of HBCUs now, through USDA have funding or through other resources to talk about estate planning, to talk about wills. I've gone to several. Within our own organization, when we do these regional meetings, I always invite someone to talk about how to address air property issues and how to start um, estate planning, how to develop wills, how to get the family together, how to facilitate these discussions. Even in my own family, we keep promoting establishing a will. Uh, a lot of black folks, they don't want to talk about, you know, death or we don't want to address the issue of the next generation. A lot of older folks will say, well, I want to leave my land to my kids. Well, you got to put that in writing mm -hmm. somehow. Uh, so we're really promoting there is here in Arkansas at the, um, the legal aid. I'm not sure about other states, but in Arkansas, there's a legal aid. They brought in a lawyer whose only job is to deal with heirs property. But the system, when you deal with the heirs property, when you're trying to resolve it, it may take up to two years. I think the system is rigged. Sometimes they're not wanting you to resolve the issue. But I mean, when I look at the legal challenges with the probate and this and that, and you got to get this signed and this signed. I was shocked when I realized here in my little world, it takes two years almost to get everything resolved and get it all, you know, documented. And that makes absolutely no sense to me. So yeah. sometimes the system is still rigged against you. <laughs> but there's money out there given to organizations <clears throat> to work with individuals. Sorry. <clears throat> to work with people about heirs property. <clears throat> if you were to Google the Center for Heirs Property, hopefully you'll get a little information for where they are and what they're doing. I know there's a group at, in Mississippi doing the same thing for Mississippi. So there is <clears throat> organizations out there. <clears throat> Excuse me. No problem. Thank you for that question, um, Kelsey, that's relevant. Ms. Ch Dr. Chester, you've left a lot of information in the chat, so I'm going to bring you on screen if you don't mind, and you can share with us the work that you're doing and, yes, and possibly talk about how you can align yourself with um, uh, Ms. Washington. How are you? How are you? Good, uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you. So I'm in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, but I wear uh, several hats that are relevant to the conversation that we're having today. One is I am the local board president for the National Association of Real Estate Brokers, NARAB. So we have local boards all across the country. And to what Ms. Washington was just talking about, one of the initiatives we're now delving into are the Black farmers. We've been into the heirs property space. So we have um, we do building Black wealth tours all across the country. We have an initiative called Don't Sell Big Mama's House. Um, we talk about estate planning, wills. 
um, trusts, et cetera. Um, I also work with a nonprofit, a national nonprofit called LISC, Local Initiative Support Corporation. Um, the LISC in Jacksonville, we have an heirs property initiative where we're we're paying the cost for those families to have those homes probated so that they get them legally put into their names. Because what happens is in Jacksonville, we have a lot of programs, roof repair, all types of programs. But if the property isn't legally yours, you can't benefit from any of those programs. And so we, to, doc, to Ms. Um, Washington's point, we partner with the local legal aids. LISC is a national organization. We're in almost, we're in 39 cities. And so... Jacksonville is starting leading that charge with the heirs property initiative, but a lot of our other local offices are now picking it up. So if you are in like one of those respective cities or states that has a LISC office, they do assist with heirs property as well as so does NAREB. NAREB is a black real estate organization. We exist because at one time black people couldn't be realtors. And so we create our own organization so that we can buy, sell and invest in real estate. And the organization still exists today. It's about 78 years old, but we're not just real estate agents. We're lenders, title companies, appraisers. Anyone that's a part that touches the real estate transaction could potentially be a NAREB member. And so we have those local boards all across the country. And so we're also now partnering with the Black Farmers um, to do those initiatives as well because they kind of tie hand in hand with the heirs' property. And so those are just some resources that I wanted to share with you all. NAREB, your local NAREB, if you have a NAREB um, in your area, or a local LISC, L-I-S-C. Could you spell NAREB? What is spelled LISC and NAREB? LISC is L-I-S-C. So it's Local Initiative Support Corporation. So L is in Lima, I is in Igloo, C is in Charlie. I'm sorry, S is in Sam, C is in Charlie. So LISC, Local Initiative Support Corporation. It's a community development financial institution, a CDFI. We get funding from the federal government, philanthropy, et cetera. D depending on which okay. office you're in, their, their, their work can look different. But our work centers a lot in Florida around heirs' property because Jacksonville is the, um, it's the largest <clears throat> incidence of heirs' property issues in the country. Really? Yeah, we have the last black... Um, intact neighborhood is in Jacksonville. And so we're working now. That's one of our things now. One of our initiatives is to ensure that that neighborhood stays black because it's near the stadium, the Jaguar Stadium, the football stadium. And there's a lot of displacement and gentrification that's about to occur. But we're um, stopping all of that gentrification through our efforts. What was the other acronym not in something? N-A-R-E-B, NAREB, National oh, Association. E of real estate brokers, NAREB. And I put a flyer, I dropped a flyer in the chat as well. The black, the building black wealth tour. Uh-huh. Those are flyer? like our we have one we're partnering with um old Jermaine, uh, not old Jermaine Simmons. Um the, the big pastor in Atlanta, his church sits on multi, multi acres. Um, I can't believe I can't think of his name. His mom just passed away. But we're actually getting ready to do a huge one in November um in Atlanta, Georgia. The building Blackwell tour, but we take those all across the country. <clears throat> and the farming, the heirs' property, all of those are initiatives that are part of that building Blackwell tour. Uh, we just got a grant that we haven't actually, it's a sub grant with the Center for Heirs' Property. Uh, it's $124,000 to National Black Growers Council to develop some type of app. We haven't even started. I don't even know how to start this. Developed so that when land is for sale or for rent for farmers, especially land that's for rent, uh, agricultural land. So maybe I can like give y'all a sub award and y'all figure it out. Okay, definitely. <laughs> definitely. Sounds good to, look, I'm taking it for you, Dr. Chester. Sounds good to me. <laughs> Dr. Chester, how'd you hear about us today? So my other organization, I've been a member. I, I some type of way through my. I'm, so I also have Black Educators Rock. I, I wear a lot of hats. So I'm the co I'm the founder and CEO of Black Educators Rock, the organization for Black educators. And some type of way, Miss Higginbotham, we got connected over two years ago. So I've been a part, okay. and I pop in and out. Thank you for popping in today. Appreciate that. <laughs> and I'm in Florida, so we need to hook up. Yes, Seriously. we do. Yeah. <laughs> yes, there's a lot to be done. So, anyway, this has been quite informative. I think a lot of people got a lot of information. And we were lucky. 
Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm calling out Kim Augustine, who's in the room. Yes. Kim yeah. Augustine has something to add to this conversation, Kim. Kim, add on. Kim, she called you out. So sorry. Okay. We can hear you. Yes, we hear you. Sorry. Thank you, Dr. Turn... Chester. Go ahead, Kim. Kim. Sorry. We can hear you. What's happening with her? Kim, we can't hear you now. Are you speaking? I don't even... Oh, Kim, are you speaking? You're... Sorry, I thought someone asked you a question. Did I miss the thing? You're breaking up. Okay. Do you know what her question is, um, Claudette? Can you tell us what it is? I know Kim does work as a consultant for the USDA to help companies get grants and funding for different type of agriculture related businesses. But I'm not sure what's going on with our phone, but maybe we can connect. I know she's definitely interested in connecting with Miss Washington at some sure. point. Um, I won't hold on. But yes. Go ahead, Miss. Go ahead, Kim. Okay. I didn't know if you could hear me. Thanks, um, Claudette. So, yeah, I have a, I work with a couple people and we work on, on these um, USDA feasibility studies. So, you know, there are a lot of programs that are available for organizations that need funding to expand their businesses. You know, what I find that's really interesting, you know, in the work that we've done with some of these organizations is the number of organizations that are not even, they don't have U.S. citizens, right? There's a lot of companies that are getting our funding from the U.S., to fund their businesses as they come over here, whether they're from India, whether they're from New Zealand, you know. So it was really interesting that um, that what, what I've seen in the work that we do, but we just do feasibility studies to help to review their entire all their opportunities to make sure that the banks feel comfortable with lending the money to these organizations. But it's really imperative that we really understand how business works how the government is funding different entities because our government actually funds entities, although they may not, they may have some U.S. Represent, representation here, but they, these owners are not Americans. They're not U.S. based. So it's really, you know, really important for us to get knowledgeable about these grants, about these programs and how we can build business. I think as a community, the, the black community, community because of our lack of, our lack of knowledge, right? It really holds us back. And when you talk about how the heirs are so, they're arguing about what to do with land, if they knew how to monetize their land, if they knew what it takes to, to be enterprising with that land, yes, it would be okay if they split it up and they could break that up, sell part of it, get some funding, build a store, build, build um, a farm, build a school. How about that, right? Um, that and then they can come up with somebody who can help them get paid off of that rather than get a hundred thousand dollars and split that up with, between 10 people so i think that's really one of the things that holds us back is how much we don't know and that's as design but now that we have this information it's really imperative that we we educate ourselves or we have someone that can educate others like one of the things i really want to start doing is building a school online to help us become more knowledgeable. Like I'm a product manager and just me seeing how large businesses use just different resources and they use, they can have lots of money. They'll still go to India and use these resources, right? To make their millions and pay them $10,000, which may cost in the US a hundred or $200,000, right? So me having that ability to see how how businesses operate really shifted my thinking, but because so many of us 
or so many that you see, you know, entertainment or, you know, athletics, like they see that as a future or just being a lawyer is great, but why not have your own law firm? Being a doctor is great, but why not think bigger and, and grow and have your own hospitals, right? I don't think that we, because of how we've been trained and programmed, we can really recognize how much further we can go. But from a USDA perspective, I was really surprised at how much money is out there and who is really taking advantage. And it's not just us, you know, as a Black community, but I'm just, just seeing that. I'm like, how could anyone from another country be able to get a hold of our tax dollars, <laughs> right, to fund businesses? And that money is going to go back to those countries or to those families, right, that that are investing in that organization. So it's quite interesting to to come to that recognition for myself. But um, so I am very knowledgeable about feasibility studies, about what banks are looking for if you have a, a business that's trying to grow. But even beyond that, um, just being a consultant, being a product manager. So I have a lot of, um, I know how to create training programs. I understand how to put certain things online. So if anyone needs help there, I'm definitely happy to help. Wonderful. Okay. That's what this is all about, helping each other. And I want to share this. Uh, I put this in the chats, but let's uh, close this out on a good note. So this is um, a little levity for today. Um, can you all see what's on the screen? So I'll just read it. It says, an old farmer writes to his son in prison. Dear son, this year I won't be able to plant potatoes because I can't dig the field by myself. I knew, I know if you were here, you would help me. Remember, he's in prison. The son writes back, dad, don't even think of digging the field because that's where I buried the money I stole. The police read the letter and the next day the whole field was dug by the police looking for the money, but nothing was found. The following day, the son wrote to the father again. Now, plant your potatoes, dad. It's the best that I can do from here. <laughs> that's a good one. So I'm going to guess that Miss Washington heard that one before. That's probably an old one, right? Is that an old farmer's joke, Miss no. Washington? No. Have but you I, heard I, that I one before? No, I've not heard that one. That's a good one. That's a good so one. I emailed it to you earlier today. I texted it to you and uh, Simonetta. So yeah, so... <laughs> But anyway, I want to say this has been a wonderful conversation. I love the way community came together to support all of this. And um, I, we were competing with Kamala Harris's birthday party and we're competing with a football mm -hmm. game. So thank you to all who showed up today. Um, and um, when people say reach out, please, you know, if they're offering the help to you, please reach out and take advantage of it. Even Miss um, Augustine um, Kim, who just spoke, she everybody has said, "I'm here if you need me, help me." So this is how we grow as a community. I try to bring everybody together. I'm just a can do it. I don't know how to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> I bring people together, and um, you know, and 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 I, if there's a few of you on here who have been inspired to farm, I just was teasing Wanda Honore. She's got a big backyard out there in California. But let me ask you, Miss Washington, because. With farming in backyards comes little vermin. Is that a problem? Oh, yeah, it's a problem. It's a big okay. problem. Everybody would tell you. It's a problem. Now, how you deal with them is the question, because they're going to come. That's just a given. Now, if, if you're present, then you can pick them off one by one, you know, and destroy them. But if you let them get out of hand... I they got out of hand with my purple peas last year because I wasn't present. It was grasshoppers. Um, and so I ended up just plowing it under because I didn't want to go in with hardcore chemicals to kill them. And I just well, I'm replanted. thinking about in the city you got rats and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. no? Just go out there and capture them one at a time. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> That's that what she says. Capture them. You can't plant some peppermint or something, that, you know. Yeah. Can you plant some peppermint and keep them away? Sugar there's some yet. there are some plants that you could actually plant. There's a thing that's called companion planting, where you can plant certain plants near each other, and that would distract, you know, that would like for example, I did uh, basil last year with my tomatoes. So all the insects, instead of going to my tomato plants, they went to the basil plants, for example. And there are a lot of uh, marigolds to attract 
certain types of things. So there's a thing that's called um, companion planting. But you know, if you got squash beetles on your squash, you once you capture them, you can get a piece of plastic uh, tape and go in behind the plant the leaf. And when you see the little egg, just take that tape and just wipe and then just pull them off. But you know, it's it's without chemicals, it's extremely time consuming to keep the the uh, human hair, I learned last year, a few years ago from Ota Gentleman, that human hair distracts uh, deers and uh, coons from your watermelon field. And I put wow. human hair, I just went to the local barber shops. It's kind of hard to go to our days to go to, unless it's a white uh, salon uh, for women, but most of us don't cut a lot of our hair off. So I would go to the barber shops and I would collect all this hair. And then I wow. went around the perimeter of my uh, my uh, watermelon had no problems with because hair retains the scent of human beings, oh, okay. so supposedly, and that kept. Now, if you're in an urban area where you can't shoot a deer, like where I was at one point, those deers didn't care because they were around humans. They knew that you were not going to harm them. Now you get out of here where I am right now. They don't cross that road because they know we eat deer, so they're smart. <laughs> well, I can I can tell you in the city. Ain't nobody picking up no rats. They, <laughs> they, 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 in the country, you might not be afraid of them, but. <laughs> Caroline, what's your last question real quick, dear? I see your hand. Not last again. question, but I did. I One of my phases of my life, I did urban gardening and the city plowed, uh, brought in and water for us. And so there are all kinds of ways in an urban environment to manage your plants. Uh, I'd say for the backyard gardener, start slow. Start slow, uh, and as, as Ms. Washington said, it's, it's, it's a time element. But my garden involves seniors and children who had never grown before. Oh, so the joy of planting and harvesting is, is phenomenal in addition to the, the, the ability to eat and, and, and bring community. And many cities have community gardens so that if you don't have the land, you can get on a list and garden. Uh, and I, I agree that, um, um, part of the issue of why people that I want to tell you the title of the panel we went to was on land loss with black farmers that where I met Mr. LaShawn yesterday. Uh, so I think that would be a future thing, but to know that there's heirs mm -hmm. work out there. And um, uh, we didn't have a farm, but when my mother passed away, we had problems with heirs. And uh, our, our three of us bought my mother's property. We bought our heirs out. Mm -hmm. uh, so however you can resolve it. And I think for a lot of what people said yesterday is, it's not weeds, it's not wills, it's deeds, which is going to save your property. You understand me? So, Mr. LaShawn, at the workshop, there were many people talked about the fight in among relatives. And I agree with Washington that this is therapy work. This is tough work because, mm -hmm. fortunately, uh, being here in Montgomery, you can see all the origins of the Black Strife. Once you visit the Legacy Museum, the Sculpture Garden, and the Lynching Memorial, it is staggering. But yes. back to this family I visited where Mr. Bowling was killed because he had too much wealth. He was so smart. He had decided to lease plantations because he knew if he owned the plantation, the white man could come forward and, and, and claim it. But they are doing major repair in this community. So I encourage you all, get your families down here to Montgomery. We need to be grounded. And of course, everybody, we need to vote. I love you, Helen. Thank you, Ms. Washington. Pleasure to hear you. Look forward to hearing and seeing you again and to all the resource people. Thank you, Helen, for building such a beautiful community. Thank you. Uh, just one last point, though. Um, in terms of the, you mentioned by not your family, one area that we really, we've talked to oftentimes about urban land. I'm now discovering that there's a lot of real estate that's part caught up in the this whole urban in the houses that been in grandpa's name on the corner of 8th and 15th street. That's a new area for me. So now we're really starting to focus not on just the land, but the real estate that has also been, been lost because of lack of taxes or whatever. But there's one last final point on urban farming. I've been doing <laughs> sessions on backyard farming and I've been letting folks know a bucket. You can take a bucket and put it on your patio. You don't really need land in just a bucket or a pot. It's amazing what you can do on a back porch. Yeah. And most people are not even aware of how much you can actually grow in a pot or a bucket. 
So I've been promoting a lot of this in the urban areas where you don't necessarily have the land, mm -hmm. but oh, you can yeah. still grow fresh vegetables mm -hmm. out of a pot. Also, I was going to ask you, what about the balcony, balcony people, <laughs> which would be me, but I don't know how to grow anything. And the other thing, if I can ask you real quick before we go, so when we're in the supermarket and we're looking at this fruit, how do you know what's good fruit? I mean, what do the labels mean? Like, how do we know what's, what's not GMO? I mean, is there, that's a whole class in itself, I would imagine. Is, There's some labeling that's now starting on um what is it GMO, but it's it's fine print. It's extremely fine print. It's really hard to read. I tend to ask where is that product coming from, and I look at the labels on whatever commodity it is. Some like an apple is very small, but I never buy anything that's out of season. If it's out of season, if it's in January and I'm buying okra, I know that's not local. Okra is not grown locally in Arkansas in January. So I tend to only focus on fruits and vegetables that's local to my community and in season. But the traceability is on every commodity. And the, but is, it it, true, is it true my, that the numbers that the numbers on the fruits and vegetables, for instance, they're telling us that if it starts with a four, that means it's highly, um, a, a high amount of pesticides and then if it starts with a nine, there's barely no uh, pesticides. Is oh, that She's putting true? it in the oh. chat as you speak, yes. I have not, I do not know that, but that's quite uh, interesting. That's what, that's what I have heard too, that um, oh, just the put numbers it in the chat. indicate whether it's organic or whether it uh, has been uh, grown with pesticides and so forth. And, and now they have this device that you can actually get on Amazon that you can take to the market with you and stick it into the um, fruit or vegetable, and it'll tell you the amount of if it, if, uh, the amount of nitrates in that product. Mm. Really? Okay, I'm writing all this down. That's interesting. I don't know what it's called, nitrate detector. I don't know what it's called, but um, there's something on the market. So I had to go pull the fruit that I just bought. And see, so you said if it starts with a nine, it's good. If it starts with a four, it's bad. Not so much bad, but it has a high amount of pesticides. Right. Ideal mm -hmm. meal. This starts with a four golden delicious <laughs> apple. Yeah. Even, so you want to wash it. You want to wash it with baking soda. Yeah. I, I usually oh my just goodness, <laughs> girl. I always cut the skin off anyway, but yeah. But all your vitamins are in the skin. Oh, I don't like skin. It's too hard to chew. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I put, I, know, I put a little orange. baking soda in my hand and some water, make it like a paste and, and just rub it on the fruits or, or, or vegetables. This is a four also. The orange is a four. Oh, boy. Yeah, the oh majority boy. of things are four. Um... It'll be on, somebody's asking about the recording. I'll put the, oh my goodness, this is a 4-2. <laughs> that's that's, that's horrible. Wash it. Just wash it and, and peel it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me ask you guys, because I buy my, I don't cook, right? So I buy lettuce in those bins. Or, you know, it's already cut up for you. Do you wash that or do you just eat it? I wash it. But it doesn't it say pre-washed? I don't, I don't care. Wash I still wash it. Yeah, you pre-wash it, but the water's got so much chemicals in it. <laughs> Look, we're, we're doomed. We're just doomed. <laughs> That's true, too. This is true. This is true. Uh, Barbara Clark said, wash it. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. This has been such good information. So uh, basically all the fruit that we buy and vegetables is just nonsense. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I can never tell what's a good, you know, Remember when we were kids, the, the, the oranges, you would eat them and the juice would run down your arms. Those days are over. I don't even think they make orange. I mean, like the fact that I'm saying they make oranges, it's supposed to be growing oranges. Mm -hmm. And then there's another conversation that can be had, which we're not going to get into about this whole thing about seeds and these companies um, taking ownership of seeds so that you can't even grow your own stuff. Is that true as well? Yeah, pretty yeah. much. And, they don't and find too much find, pollinator seeds. Come to yeah. find out, I think it was on your program, Helen, 
that the Native Americans had a whole system where they would um, save seeds and pass them on to each other. Mm -hmm. You know, so this has been mm -hmm. a long time uh, 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 behavior, you know, but I'm here right now at the age of 70, just finding out that carrots are purple. I know, I didn't know that. Is that right, Miss Washington? I have no idea. Oh, <laughs> that's a new one on me. Right. Is that know. right, Simonetta? Do you know Just they're like purple? Corn. I mean, there's the multiplicity of like different varieties By of different corn. species. Yeah, potatoes and and mm -hmm. carrots. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't be surprised. Um, okay. be and also surprised. bananas too. Mm -hmm. What color are they supposed to be? Look no, no, yellow. different types of color, bananas. but like shape, size. Right. 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 You know, it varies. Right. right. All right. This could go on forever. Ladies, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. And um, our casa is your you casa. Uh, Miss Washington, you know, please come again. Um, we oh, talk I will. About all this kinds is of fun. Yeah. <laughs> Very informative. So you guys do this how often? Every Sunday. Oh. <laughs> but all different topics. I think uh, Ms. Adams is gone, Dr. Adams. Is she still with us? We'll probably do her next week. And okay. um, we need to talk about Haiti. So we got a lot of things. Um, oh, I want to do one, you know, what would we tell our younger selves? So we'll be looking for ladies. Of, uh, and, and we invite the guys, too, to some of these conversations. But I have a list of things that we're going to talk about. Um, what would I tell my younger self? Uh, and, um, of course, the election. We don't know what's coming with this election, so we'll be talking about that. Um, oh, shoot. Um, there's an Indian woman who I'm trying to get to come on to talk to us about um, multiculturalism from, um, you know, because they're told that they're white. So when they try to show up as white, what happens? And what is their relationship with us as they're trying, you know, being showing up as white? So I have a whole list of stuff that I, I need to schedule. And um, we'll just keep it going. As long as you all keep showing up, I'll keep doing it. But I keep putting in the chats, folks, that, you know, donations are welcome. It takes me time to do all this, and I appreciate it. Um, and I've opened my store. So this is one of my T-shirts. Um, and there's, a, so I put the link there. So check out the store. I'll be putting more stuff in it. But um, in the interim, thank you all so much. And uh, if we all, I'll take everybody all spotlight and we can just say good night. That'll be great. Um, let me remove the spotlights. This is what I should be somewhere. I could do them all at once. Simonetta, I love you, girl. Simonetta <laughs> and I have written a book ourselves. You know, Simon, we've already written a book just between our chats on WhatsApp. Oh <laughs> Download it real. and react. And collaborate and do something for sure. Exactly. And Miss Washington, now we're going to have to pull you into the loop. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And you're in Arkansas. I have never been. I love Memphis, but I've never ventured across the, the uh, highway there to, to Arkansas. So I have to get down there. You got a place to stay. Oh, it's not a bread, it's not a bread and breakfast, but it's big enough to host guests. Okay. I love visiting. So come on down. Oh. Oh boy, she shouldn't have said that. Y'all tell her what y'all don't know. I just came <laughs> off the road for two weeks on I do my southern treks. So I'll show Ooh. up at your doorstep and everybody heard you That's say I can come. <laughs> my whole oh. family has a key to my house. It's always open. Beautiful. Thank love you. it. Love it. We've gotten away from that. So I love it. All right, everybody. So we're on um, gallery view and I just want to say thank you again. Uh, I don't know if there's enough regulars on here to do our, our, our farewell because when black women gather, what happens? Amazing, amazing, amazing things, things happen. happen. Hey. Thank you for another amazing Sunday, and we'll start recording right now. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, Miss Washington. Good evening, thank everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good to see you, Kelson. Please, you know, don't be a stranger. Yes, yes, and I'll forward you any info concerning our wrong page.